Really, Spino? You're kinda cutting me off here. <sighs> Hello, everybody. Sometimes dinosaurs go on to become very obscure, and sometimes they go on to become very famous. And I would argue that this one is both at the same time. It's very recognizable and popular in some circles, but as far as general knowledge for most people go, I don't think this one is too well known. Today we are talking about what I think is one of the coolest dinosaurs to have ever existed. One, easily recognizable, very unique and fascinating, but not known to a lot of people because, let's put it this way, some people only know dinosaurs from Jurassic Park. And this one didn't appear in that series till the worst one in it. Though I'll also add that this dinosaur was the star of the only truly good scene in Jurassic World Dominion. Hey, that's fine. Oh, we're starting off with a bold statement today. I'll be quiet, you smug lizard. We're not talking about you today. We're talking about the giant herbivorous dinosaur, Therizinosaurus. I have been wanting to get back into making documentaries on dinosaurs for a while. And this is going to be a fun one to start with. The Therizinosaurus is just cool. It really is. Its name is even cool. It means scythe lizard. So let's go all in, get up close and personal, and have a detailed look at this fascinating dinosaur that went from being a giant turtle to a giant dinosaur. If you enjoy videos like this, like and subscribe so that I know you do and you want to see more like it, and it also really helps me grow. And check out my other videos on prehistoric animals. I'll link them in the description. Okay, let's get right to it and start with the discovery of the animal. And the reason people first thought it was a big turtle instead of a dinosaur. So the thing that jumps out to you most when looking at the Therizinosaurus are its giant claws on its hands. And those are what first jumped out at paleontologists, too. Yeah, I know, Spino. We'll bring that up later. The first Therizinosaurus fossils were discovered in the late 1940s. 1948 specifically, but they weren't described officially until the mid-1950s. This dinosaur grew to be 16 feet tall and over 30 feet long. Would not want to be nose-to-beak with one. Now... When they were first found, the expedition was led by USSSR Academy of Sciences, and they were in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. They were searching specifically for fossils, and <laughs> boy did they find them. The expedition discovered multiple dinosaur and turtle fossils, but one really stood out. Three pairs of partial unguals, or claw bones. And that were of a very unusual size. In 1954, these fossils and a few others that were found nearby came together to be described as the new animal, which was named Therizinosaurus. The specimen number was PIN551483. With how little there was to go on at the time, the original theory put forth was that the Therizinosaurus was not a dinosaur, but a giant turtle or a turtle-like reptile that used its giant claws to feed on seaweed. The Therizinosaurus fossils we have are fragmentary, like so many other animals, but what we have include the claws of the original specimen, arms of another, some ribs, part of a foot, um, that's about it really. But this is not really all that unusual. Well-preserved fossil specimens are rare. So paleontologists usually only get to work with very fragmentary remains. And somehow I always end up only talking about the ones that are very fragmentary. More fossils of Therizinosaurus were later found in the 1960s. In 1968, the upper portion of another claw was found. In 1973, a more whole and complete specimen was discovered. This specimen is known as MPC. D-115, and it consists of both the left and right arm of the dinosaur, which, by the way, the arm alone is like as big as a person. The scale of this dinosaur is crazy. This specimen also consisted of ribs from the belly area, both humeri, the upper arm bones, right ulna with radius, and the left ulna, two right carpals, and the right metacarpus, including a complete digit two. 
1973, the specimen NPC D145 was discovered, and it consists of a right hind line with a fragmentary femur, parts of a tibia, pieces of a four toed foot, and a few other leg bones, giving a good idea of the lower leg structure of the animal. With those in mind, they were described in 1982, and it was around this time that paleontologists in the Soviet Union began to say that the remains were not a giant turtle, but of a rather large dinosaur. In 2010, American paleontologist Lindsay E. Zano re-examined specimen in PCD 145 and concluded that the ribs likely came from a sauropod dinosaur and not a Therizinosaurus. Now, even though our remains are, even today, fragmentary, we do know a lot about this dinosaur. As I've said, it got large, believed to have grown up to 33 feet in length, and standing up to 16 feet high. It's one of the largest dinosaurs, and the largest of its whole extended clade of dinosaurs. Proportionally to the size, though, the skull was small, it was adorned with a beak, it had a long neck, and a small head, which gave a stark contrast to the very large belly that the animal had. The Therizinosaurus had a large belly for foliage processing. The animal also was covered in at least a light layer of feathering, but it also might have been a thicker coat of feathers too. Artist depictions of the animal today kind of vary. The legs were also long, like 9.8 feet long, and the forearm was nearly that long as well for a little context. But of course, as I have mentioned, the most standout thing about the Therizinosaurus are its large claws. It's not called scythe lizard for nothing. So let's talk about the claws and the forelimbs. The arm as a whole was 7.9 feet long. The scapula, or the shoulder blade, alone was 26 inches long. The coracoid, a bone attached to the lower end of the scapula, was 14 inches in length. The humerus, or the long upper arm bone, as you can see in the picture on screen, was robust, strong, and was 30 inches long. The lower end of it was also very expanded and flared. The ulna, or the larger and more posterior of the two bones in the forearm, was over 24 inches long. If you couldn't tell, it's a big arm, and we're not done with it yet, but I already wouldn't want to be in an arm wrestling competition with this dinosaur. The radius, the smaller and anterior of the two bones of the forearm was 22 inches long, rounded up, and it was shaped like a slight S-curve, with the upper end of it being very wide and the distal end being highly robust. You know, having the whole arm preserved is both a blessing and a curse. A blessing because it's very cool to have our fossils of this dinosaur when overall they're limited, but a curse because now I have to go through and name all these bones, which I'm probably not pronouncing right, but Oh well, I guess you can laugh. The first lower carpal bone, which is the bones that form the wrist and connects the forearm, the radius and the ulna, to the hand. It was 3.36 inches and had two articulation surfaces on its lowermost end. The upper surface of the bone was divided by a broad depression that formed the articulation of the carpus. Now what is the carpus? Well, I'm happy you asked. The carpus is the bones that form the wrist. You have it too. The palm of the dinosaur was around five or so inches across, the inner border was thin and narrow, and its lateral side was broad on the uppermost side. So that was a lot of terms and a lot of bones, so why don't we actually cover the function and the purpose of the forelimb and the giant claws? As I mentioned, when Therizinosaurus was first described, it was thought that it was a big old turtle and said turtle used its claws to gather and eat seaweed. Well, spoiler, but no. Therizinosaurus is not a giant marine turtle. Shocking, I know. Well, once it was figured out that Therizinosaurus was in fact not a giant turtle, one of the earliest theories was that its claws were used to dig up loose soil. However, this theory was not supported by the fragility of the actual claws. A study in 2014, which tested the claws of various Therizinosaurs, came to the conclusion that their claws 
specifically the claws of the Therizinosaurus itself, could not be used to dig. Also, that the dinosaur was too big to really be a digger at all. Also, since its arms were covered in feathers, it would make digging even more difficult. Though it was also suggested that the dinosaur would use its hind limbs, its legs, for digging if it needed to. Instead, the theory that the researchers came to was that Therizinosaurus used its claws like giant ground sloths, using them to hook onto vegetation. There is currently no evidence supporting that they used their claws for defense, though it would be very cool. It was very cool in Walking with Dinosaurs, and I've even used the idea in one of my own short stories, because it's cool. <laughs> but it's also possible that they were not used as weapons, but rather deterrent or intimidation towards predators when they came too near for the dinosaur's comfort. What evidence we'd be looking for to see if they ever did use them for defense, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know if they would be strong enough to leave actual scratch marks on the bones of a predatory dinosaur. The most recent published study on the matter in 2023 concluded and argues that the claws might have just been decorative and not really served any mechanical function. This study argued that the claws were merely a result of growth congruent with the increased body size of the dinosaur, but I feel like if they were useless, they would have evolved out. So the dinosaur must have had a reason for them. Sure, maybe they didn't serve any mechanical function for the dinosaur, but they could have still been used for intimidation at the least. I just feel like they had to have had some purpose because they didn't evolve out of the dinosaur like useless traits tend to do so in most species. There was also some evidence that Therizinosaurus had its forearm and claws appear at the same time as similar appendages did in other animals not related to the dinosaur. So if multiple animals have convergent evolution of the same traits despite not being related, I feel like there had to be a reason and thus a use for them to evolve those traits. I touched on them briefly in the forelimb section. Now we're going to look at the hind limbs of the dinosaur. The legs, the feet, also one of the sections that we have fossils of, which, you know, makes my job easier. The Therizinosaurus had robust bones on its hind limbs, just like on the forelimbs. I guess you could call it a robustosaurus. Yeah, I know, that wasn't very funny. But it is true. It was a very robust dinosaur. I covered some of the hind limb fossils we have earlier, but let's have a more detailed look at them. So one thing you'll notice right away is that most theropod dinosaurs have three toes on each foot. Therizinosaurus has four toes on each foot. Specific details about the animal's hind limbs include that unique trait of the dinosaur having four toes. Most theropods have three. On Therizinosaurus, the first digit was a weight-bearing one, number two and three were as long as number one, and four was smaller and a tad bit thinner. Some other details include a stocky and robust tibia. Some paleontologists have actually theorized that the animal might have used its hind limbs for digging if there was ever the need, as the claws on its hands could have likely prevented the animal from digging with its forelimbs. Now, let's talk about the Therizinosaurus's feeding habits. Well, as I've mentioned a few times now, herbivore. The dinosaur was a plant-loving herbivore. A 2018 study suggests that the Therizinosaurus, being a derived member of other Therizinosaurians, actually had a reduced bite force, which might have been useful for cropping vegetation or foraging. It has also been suggested that the Therizinosaurus might have sat on its pelvis while feeding. Think about how giant sloths are always so shown sitting on their haunches while foraging. But an even better example might be how gorillas sit how they eat. It might have been similar with the dinosaur. This pose asserts that the dinosaur would sit as it consumed foliage and bushes and trees and any other plant material. Its arms are also long enough to have touched the ground if the dinosaur was in certain standing stances. Another animal with a similar eating style could have been Cylanthrotherium, which lived millions of years after the Therizinosaurus did. It's another case of convergent evolution bringing similar traits into an unrelated species. Even if it's one millions of years later, it's still an example. Both had bodies situated or sitting while foraging with long, robust arms. Yeah. 
You know, learning about the dinosaur itself is all fine and dandy, but what about the world it lived in? What about the animals it shared its world with? Let's get to that now. Therizinosaurus lived approximately 70 to 66 million years ago, as well as we can estimate. This age range tells us that Therizinosaurus lived in the Maastrichtian age. And no, I'm not going to look up to see if I pronounce that word right. It's funnier if I get it wrong and have to struggle through it like it's quicksand. I will put it on screen, though. This age was in the late Cretaceous. Maastrichtian aged dinosaurs and other animals too include, here we go with the funny mispronunciations, Nemgetosaurus, Arsinonymus, Gallimimus, Prinsocephale, Bagaritin, the Tyrannosaurid Tarbosaurus, some Dromaeosaurs, the Crocodilimorph Perilligator, some turtles, kinda ironic, and birds like Juden Norris and Tevinoris. That was a whole lot of big words, and I bet I got a lot of them wrong. So here they are on screen. Laugh at me. Now those are just a few. A literal drop in the bucket of what really must have been a fascinating ecosystem to have seen in person. Sadly, we can only imagine it, but from those animals I just listed, you get an idea of how diverse it must have been even if imagining is likely only a shadow of what it really once was. Some paleontologists have argued that the presence of large carnivores like Tarbosaurus being present in the area suggests that the Therizinosaurus might have used its claws for intimidation when one came too close, a theory we covered earlier. But here is an example of an actual animal that might have needed to be faced with such a display. Therizinosaurus was tall enough that a fully grown Tarbosaurus likely wouldn't have been able to bite one on anywhere above the belly at most. But that doesn't mean you would have been fine with one walking up for a bite either. Fossils and trace fossils found with or in the area around Therizinosaurus fossils tell us that the dinosaur likely preferred to forage in rip Aryan areas, which are the regions between land and a river or a stream. They can also be called buffers, corridors, strips, or forests and woodlands. Now, what was the Maastrichtian age itself like? Well, there is more going on here than there was in the Boring Billion. The supercontinent Pangaea had nearly fully broken up at this time, insert other synonym here, though some regions of land far apart today hadn't separated just yet. The climate itself was warm and humid initially, like it had been throughout the Mesozoic as a whole, but it began to show signs of the future in the Sage too. The Cenozoic was right around the corner, and the colder and more arid climate of the Cenozoic began creeping in during this swan song age of the dinosaurs. Ocean current reorganization likely caused the temperature change, as thermohaline circulation, like we have today in the Atlantic, began to take hold in the oceans. The western interior seaway also drained, contributing more to global cooling. The Maastrichtian age itself went on until 66 million years ago, when the KPG extinction event occurred, bringing about the end of the Mesozoic and the extinction of all non-avian dinosaurs, plesiosaurs, mosasaurs, and other large marine life, pterosaurs, and other groups of animals. The mammals were the ones who pulled through well enough. They handled it pretty well. Reptiles like various crocodilians and snakes also survived, along with the only dinosaurs which pulled through, the birds. Basically, most groups, or at least the ancestors of the groups that we have today, we only have because they survived one of the biggest mass extinctions in Earth's history. So circling it all back around, let's cover some of those animals that Therizinosaurus lived alongside of in a little bit more detail. The Perilligator was a genus of Neosuchin crocodilimorph that lived until about 70 million years ago, which got up to 13 feet in length. 
The genus has two recognized species, as well as a few misassigned ones as well. It likely preyed on a few of the smaller dinosaurs we covered earlier, along with, likely, small mammals and anything else it could have eaten. Maybe even young Therizinosaurus before they got big enough to step on these guys. Which had to have happened at least once. The Gallimimus was a theropod dinosaur that lived around 70 million years ago in the same region that Therizinosaurus did. Fossils from animals at various stages of maturity have been found, and the species was first described in 1972. Gallimimus was likely to have been a fast dinosaur. Some paleontologists argue that it could have gotten up to a speed of 50 miles an hour when running. Now, the beak of the Gallimimus themselves are like the ones seen on ducks and geese today. So, unlike Lex's Hope in Jurassic Park, these were easily meat-eating Metasaurus. They likely swallowed small prey like fish in one gulp, like the aforementioned waterfowl sometimes do. However, that might age poorly because the diet of almost all dinosaurs in the extended family of Gallimimus is very poorly understood. Recent evidence suggests that body mass does not correlate with the type of food and the intake, meaning we really don't know what this animal ate. So until we do, I wouldn't get too close to it. Nemactosaurus. Yes, I looked up how to pronounce it. And funny time for mispronunciations is over. Now it's time to be serious. Which means reptile from Nemect was a sauropod, another larger dinosaur. It was named after a basin in the Gobi Desert, and like those others, it was from the late Cretaceous. Who could have guessed? It has a skull which resembles those on the diplodocoids, but this seems to be a case of convergent evolution because this animal is a titanosaur, like the Saltosaurus. It has been found in the same fossil beds as other titanosaurs as well. What this animal ate is unknown, as no plant fossils from the area it lived in have been found, but in this time period, flowering plants were very diverse, along with ferns and conifers and other low-growing plants. The vegetation was as diverse as the animal life. Nemectomia, something completely different despite the similar name, this one was a much smaller dinosaur and member of the Oviraptor family that lived around 70 million years ago. Its name refers to it like the last one, where it was found, and the second half of its name, which is Good Mother. So this dinosaur's name was essentially Good Mother from Nemect. The Good Mother portion of its name is a reference to the fact that Oviraptors are known to have brooded their eggs. This dinosaur was 7 feet in length and likely weighed somewhere around 85 pounds. It is almost guaranteed that this dinosaur was covered in feathers as well. Like other members of the Oviraptor family, the exact diet of this animal is debated. Ancyromimus, again, looked it up, time for comedy and funny mispronunciations is not now, is a genus of kinda lanky, I mean just look at the picture, Ornithomimoid theropod dinosaur from the late Cretaceous period. Shocking at this point, I know. It has been described as lanky by paleontologists, I called that one, and it is likely to have been a very fast-running omnivorous dinosaur. As should surprise no one at this point, this dinosaur was found in Mongolia, in the Gobi Desert. There is only one specimen of this dinosaur, but we got lucky with it, as this dinosaur is almost complete and very well articulated, only lacking the skull and its lower jaw. This dinosaur was just shy of 10 feet long. It had a stronger forearm than other members of its extended family of dinosaurs. And why the arm is so strong is unknown, but it might be related to its food gathering strategy, or it could have been a carryover from carnivorous ancestors, though this animal itself was likely either an omnivore or even an herbivore. This next one, though, is definitely not an herbivore, though. I didn't say you were, Spino. The Tarbosaurus, probably the most famous animal that lived alongside of the Therizinosaurus, and likely its greatest non-herbivorous rival is a relative of the T-Rex. This Tyrannosaurid 
has had many proposed and named species, but only one is recognized by paleontologists today. You shouldn't be surprised, but this alarming lizard lived in Mongolia. I know, who could have guessed at this point? This bipedal dinosaur was also a carnivore. Again, I wouldn't have guessed. It was described in 1955, and the holotype specimen was called PIN 551-1. Most of our fossil specimens are either adult or subadult. Juveniles are rare finds, with specimen MPC D107-7 being found in 2006 and described in 2011. This specimen led to the theory that juvenile Tarbosaurus might have been nocturnal hunters, but if adults were is unknown due to the lack of evidence from available fossils. In 2006, it was found that the Tarbosaurus had a bite force of around 8,000 to 10,000 pounds per square inch. It could crush bones just like its relative in North America, the T-Rex. So, just think about that as you stare into the gaping jaws of this one. Happy it's dead? I wouldn't want to see that sight coming towards me on a live one. So, that was the Therizinosaurus, and assorted company, but mostly Therizinosaurus. A very fascinating dinosaur, and one, I believe, Nigel Marvin got a kiss from. Yeah, didn't he get licked in the face by one? One that was way friendlier than that one in Jurassic World? Well, that's not exactly the same thing, Spino, but okay. You all tell me what you thought of this dinosaur. I think Therizinosaurus is fascinating. What about you, Spino? Oh, hush you. What do you lovely viewers think? Tell me what you think about the Therizinosaurus. Spino, stop it! I'm trying to finish up this video, and I already picked the next topic. No, it's not the Spinosaurus. So stop. Cease and desist. Anyway, Therizinosaurus is a very cool dinosaur, and... If you didn't know much about it, I hoped you learned something and that you enjoyed and that you also enjoyed my horrifying mispronunciations of all of those dinosaurs. So many paleontologists are probably coming after me now with pitchforks and torches. Also, if you enjoyed, check out my other documentaries on prehistoric animals. I've covered Acroganthosaurus, Pyroraptor, Eotyrannus, Auroran, and other early hominids, and Atasuchus and other prehistoric crocodiles, Helicoprion, Smog, Dunkleosteus. I even covered an entire period of time with the Boring Billion video. As you can see, I covered things from relatively recent times to much more ancient ones, so go check them out. I love prehistory topics so much, and stay tuned because the next prehistory topic we're covering is going to be the Utah Raptor. It is a fascinating and kind of scary animal, and I think it will be a very interesting topic. So until then, thank you for watching. Please don't burn me at the stake for the mispronunciations. I'm just here to entertain, and I corrected them, so please forgive me. I, forgive me. I hear an angry mob of paleontologists knocking down my door, so please forgive me. I'm sorry. Have a good one, everyone.